I'm Emily Becker, and our guest today is Josh Smith, the frozen plant guy. I know uh, people have been looking forward to this for a while. He's going to be talking about all the plants. A few words of introduction. This program is being brought to you by a collaboration between Rural Cap and Tribes Extension. And um, we've been, we've hosted, we've had two webinars so far this season. Both have that been about food for us. But just because the content is awesome, awesome, but also because uh, Rural Cap was awarded a grant from the USDA Forest Service, and we are we've released a request for proposals to have um, for people to apply to have food forests or orchards in their communities, and we're going to put that link in the chat there. If you're uh, looking, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find that RFP at our Rural Cap website and also on our Grow Facebook page. So um, I, without further ado, <laughs> you can see Josh is getting ready. Oh, um, more so here than I expected. <laughs> uh, oh, good. Yeah. Let me introduce Josh. Um, I think everybody knows he's absolutely a lifelong plant fanatic. He grew up um, in the Fairbanks North Pole area. He was a member of Future Farmers of America, and he graduated um, from North Pole High School, did a stint in the U.S. Air Force, and now he lives in the mild climb of Chugach. Uh, where he loves pushing the boundaries of what can be grown in Alaska and has been doing lots and lots of different experiments with plants. And um, those of you that are tuning in on YouTube and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to um, set this on one and a half speed so I can get through it quickly. Ha, huh? good luck with that. Welcome, everybody. And uh, welcome, Josh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for joining me. Um, I, for those of you who heard me talk, I will ramble on like I will cram an impossible amount of information in a short period of time. So I'm sorry in advance, but my ADHD just, it goes full bore. It doesn't go at all. But um, I'm a big plant geek. I don't have any degrees in horticulture. I don't have any degrees in meteorology or uh, climatology. I'm just a big old plant geek and I'm passionate about growing food here in the state of Alaska. The reality is we've seen what's happened in recent years when it comes to food on the shelves. It shows that our food systems are more fragile here in Alaska. And then with the challenges of climate change and some, some being good for agriculture, some being much more challenging, I just took that of, hey, maybe I can channel my, my attention and my passion for plants into growing more food and experimental foods and also propagating native foods. So that's kind of my lens. But if you can swap over to the PowerPoint, please. We'll kind of get on going and just let me know what questions you have. So, so let's see. Will I still be visible, sort of? Can you guys see me? Yep, it looks great from our end. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you. you. So, wait, you wait. Oh, yeah, I was going to put it in presentation mode, I think, here. Yeah. There we go. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So uh, as you can see, that's an absolutely lovely Evan Sour cherry right there, which if you have a yard in Alaska outside of like the Valley Bottoms in uh, the Fairbanks area, you need to have Evan's cherry it will out yield any other sour cherry by like 10 to 1. But nonetheless, so if you guys want to follow me, um, those are my social media platforms. I do a lot of plant videos and also a lot of advocacy. But um, yeah, please follow me. And if you if you're on Facebook, I do a bunch of I try to share all my plant stuff and over communicate that because I'm a nerd and I want to share with fellow nerds. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we will be covering today is um, we'll, we'll talk about like lens when it comes to growing food here in the state of Alaska and also like how we expect climate change to impact that and some of our practices when it comes to growing things because a lot of what we're discovering we're growing here in Alaska wasn't possible 50 years ago so we're kind of in unprecedented or, uh, unprecedented realm right now so we're trying to kind of adapt our practices and maybe lean into the challenges where we have more growing degree days we have warmer soils where we have uh, longer seasons less extreme winters at least on average more or less snowpack so we can kind of adapt to those challenges and then also adapting to some of the problems whether we live in a fairly dry climate and when the temperatures above freezing for longer it, there's going to be more drought stress that's present and then so irrigation then of pests and diseases that make their way up whether it's from warming climate or from just people bringing in through horticulture and how we can kind of lean into that and then so how does that uh, how does the sh shifting of the climate impact our parameters and what are we going to lean into when it comes to growing different species and different fruits um, we'll talk about, um, I'm sorry, something that isn't talked about very often is cultivating and utilizing native species within our landscapes. Um, for so long, people bring in species from lower 48 plants. And mind you, I do the same thing, but we have so many beautiful species we can be incorporating into our systems that add value to the local ecology and are absolutely beautiful. 
Like, I mean, I'll show you some, like, but I have some wild blueberries from seed that are only two months old. So it's very much possible We'll talk about how we propagate those. We'll talk about some of the trials we're experimenting with, with the Future Crops Initiative and the various trials across the state. Um, we'll talk about, you can't have a meaningful conversation about planting new species in a bioregion without talking about invasive potential. We've all seen the news regarding maydays and bird cherries and choke cherries. Nobody wants to plant the next choke cherry because nobody wants to harm bullwinkle with what we plant. So what are the evolutionary characteristics of what we're planting and whether we're planting a problem or not? And then we'll talk more about some of the projects we're doing with Rebarcheck and the Future Crops Initiative, and then what I'm doing to adapt the practices and how you can get involved if you want to grow more food within your space, whether a food forest or more traditional agriculture. Next slide, please. So I want to start off with we're on denying the land. And I, I, it's so, I'm so fortunate to be able to try to learn to be a better steward of this landscape and learn from the Denina people and try to practice and utilize our native species more within our landscape. So every day I'm trying to learn more and more and I, hopefully I can be a proper steward of this landscape and learn more from the indigenous people that have been here first. But a little bit about me, I'm just a giant plant geek, you guys. Like I grew up, uh, I was when I was young, I lived in Washington and every time I saw a tree, I pointed it out to my parents. So you can imagine my parents went pretty crazy. Finally, I started learning the different names of the species and now it's I'm rattling off Latin names of all of them because I'm just a giant geek. But it's honestly like my happy place is my food forest to have up on my mountainside up in Chugiak. So um, let's see. So when it comes to uh, like some of my aspirations, I'm trying to get more people engaged because for so long when I was a kid, I lived in Fairbanks. Their growing season's 90 days if you're lucky. Uh, give up on any perennials because they're not going to be hardy. You're zoned one. And I didn't like that concept. I'm a really stubborn individual. So we started experimenting with different species, even in my parents' zone 1B yard in North Pole. And they have an eight foot Alma sweet sour cherry, or uh, Alma apple. They have uh, Carmine Jewel sour cherry. They have Saskatoon's currants, gooseberries. And so it came to show that there's more potential even within extreme climate like North Pole. So now that I live in Anchorage, it's like I'm in the banana belt. Like people don't realize here in South Central, like how good we have it. So I have a rainier sweet cherry growing. I have English walnuts. I have hazelnuts. I have chestnuts. They're all surviving so far. And honestly, some of them are doing pretty well. My still sweet cherry is growing like a weed right now. Um, but my ultimate goal is uh, bare mountain forest nursery. I want to make some of these species available, whether it's experimental, leaning into the challenges of climate change, or propagating our beautiful native species, like this little beauty, vaccine cestitosum, dwarf huckleberry. So that's going to be the goal of the nursery. So actually, Oh, that one? Maybe. no. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a shot. <laughs> so, hey, Josh. But, um, can, yeah, can you show that one again? Because I don't think we got to see it. Uh, um, you might have to turn off the background. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. It doesn't look like a whole lot, but this is a one year dwarf huckleberry vaccine cespitosum from 3,000 feet up on Hatcher's Pass. And so, uh, being a plant geek, I go up to Hatcher's Pass and there's four or five different species of blueberries and huckleberries. So, I literally have bags for the different species as I'm picking them. And turns out they're actually pretty easy to grow from seed. So let's see if you guys can see this. Nope, just okay. salmonberry start in the just background. Doing some technology experiments here. <laughs> so, um, Josh, while you're while you're doing that, um, when will your nursery be open to the public for people to buy plants? So my goal is to have. Uh, I want to be selling plants by this June. It's probably going to be a soft opening, and it's going to be more of a pop up. I go sell at plant sales or various public events. I just realized my property. I only have so much and I love to fill it in with as much greener as possible, which doesn't bode well for actually having public walk onto the property. Having a one and a half foot wide trail down to the nursery space is just dangerous. So I'll probably, I'm planning about mid-June this year. I have hazelnuts that are ready to dig up and sell and just uh, enough time to kill them into pots. So hopefully mid-June, fingers crossed. But, awesome. And so maybe, to, and uh, maybe the, the projects we're all doing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, maybe the people on the webinar right now could have like, you know, special access. I'm just asking. <laughs> hey, we can make that work. I, again, I'm trying to propagate a lot of our native, uh, specifically blueberries and raspberries uh, here in Alaska. So I have we, a lot we of- We could probably do an event at Rabarchik, Josh. Absolutely. We, so at, actually that's a really good idea. So we may end up uh, selling some plants and having some sort of plant event at Rabarchik. I don't want to speak for the, for the Rebarchek project, but I think that'd be an excellent opportunity to bring folks in and then share the beautiful plants that we're trying to trying to distribute. So, and that kind of, that segues into the Rebarchek agricultural project. That's a neat project that I've been working with. And actually I just heard Elena. Elena is one of my co-conspirators there. And so what we're doing is 
the rebar check is one of the original colony farms from the 1930s in Palmer. Well, we're trying to turn it into the past, present, and future of agriculture in Alaska. So the past being um, the antique uh, power equipment and the old farmstead and things of that nature. But we're also, okay, modern agriculture. Some people are propagating rhodiola and there's fields of oats and potatoes and things like that. But our piece is the future piece. So we're actually planting one of the first food forests in the Matsu Valley. And so incorporating indigenous stewardship and indigenous teachings of plants that are already growing there and also incorporating different edible species into the landscape. We have local apricots, pears, plums, we have kiwis, shisandra berry, and we're hoping to incorporate and then lots of herbaceous herbs. We want to showcase what a food forest is. And honestly, it's bringing a lot of attention in even the Matsu, which is very traditional agriculture. So it's a neat opportunity. We have hazelnuts that are going on three years now. Uh, out there and they grew like little weeds. We have a hookah culture bed. So it's an amazing opportunity where it's a great way to showcase some of the regenerative practices in the Matsu. Um, the Future Crops Initiative, that's that's an amazing project. We've, I've, it's, uh, I've been working with the Matthews Experiment Farm and then also the folks up in Fairbanks. And so this last year we planted 150 hybrid hazelnuts from Riverbend Hazelnuts in North Dakota at the Matsu, uh, at uh, the Matthews Experiment Farm in Palmer. And then another hundred of the hazelnuts went up to Fairbanks, planted the Georgeson Botanical Garden in the trial plantings, and then the various microclimates all around Fairbanks, because anybody from Fairbanks knows you literally have zone 3B to 1A just based off of elevation and uh, slope orientation. So we're trying these hybrid hazelnuts, which should be reliable into zone 3 across the spectrum of microclimates of the Fairbanks area and here in South Central. And hopefully the Future Crops Initiative will continue on into other species like uh, I want to breed apricots and apples and pears and plums and maybe walnuts. We're we're picking ripe walnuts in Anchorage nowadays, so it goes to show that maybe there's more potential there than we originally thought. So that's part of what we want to lean into that versus react to it. And then still working on the, the article for Arnoldia. I haven't quite gotten there yet, so kind of got a little bit busy. But so um, when we talk about like growing different, like so the, some of the people think of, we also had an update when it came to the USDA hardiness zone. Oh, cool, we're zone 5A in most of Anchorage, zone 5B in coastal Anchorage. And then there's a little sliver of zone 5B that slips up to buy my, my house. The problem is, is that only tells you the bare minimum of information when it comes to growing perennials in Alaska. Because in reality, zone three, people are like, oh, that's extremely cold. Uh, from Fairbanks perspective, zone three is the banana belt. That, you can actually grow sour cherries in that. But the reality is zone three, you can be over a gnome and be zone three or zone four, four A. But zone three in Willow is a very different climate because it's all based off of your average minimum temperature over a 30 year span. And it doesn't even take into extremes. So if you average, okay, you hit negative 20, negative 20, negative 20, and then you have one outlier that goes to negative 50, your negative 20 range, you're still zone four, even though you have one extreme event that goes down to zone one. And that one freak event is what's gonna damage your plants more than anything. So that zone, USDA hardiness zone, it's nice to kind of get a feel for whether you wanna try something, but it tells you the bare minimum. Things that are far more important when it comes to growing fruits and nuts and things like that are your growing season length and then your accumulated heat. Because there's some species like barley that'll germinate at 32 degrees and that's when the clock, basically the biological clock starts ticking, it starts maturing. There's other species like garden plants, corn and tomatoes, its baseline number where it even starts doing anything is 50 degrees. So you have to figure out the growing degree days. Um, so up in Fairbanks, you get a lot more accumulated heat in your shorter growing season. So you're more apt to ripen things like plums up in Fairbanks than you are here in South Central. But that's something that we're expecting that will change uh, here in South Central Alaska. We, they are expecting overall to have a higher accumulation of growing degree days. So we may be able to ripen more fruits. And then the growing season is getting longer, again, averages. And then something that we saw back in the mid to, uh, 2010s was we saw a long string of winters with minimal snowpack, which honestly, from a perennial perspective, is one of the hardest things with, when it comes to fruit trees. People think of, oh, a snowpack is, uh, it's cold, blah, blah. Snowpack insulates your ground. Because when you have uh, all your snowpack blow off or melt off, and then you have, uh, so everything's warm, the ground starts thawing, and then you have a hard freeze and temperatures get really low, you have no insulation of the roots. And arguably, some of these zone two apples, the most fragile part of the tree are the roots. So when the trees are exposed to that free saw, free saw, that'll wreak more havoc on the tree than just outright cold. And so snowpack is something that, historically speaking, hasn't always been the most reliable here in South Central Alaska, at least coastal regions. And honestly, that could be exacerbated as time goes on, depending on what direction the climate goes. And then so, and then again, we can't have taken into consideration extremes will be extremes and extremes will be exacerbated based off of the meandering jet stream and when things get stuck. 
last summer was a prime example where we had the warm dry for half the summer and then there was a light switch in July and then it went to record rains the rest of the season. We need to be anticipating those kind of extremes. So that's where diversity comes in. And that's why I love the food forest like model when it comes to growing uh, perennial abundance. So, and then when it comes to resiliency and such. So next slide, please. So um, I already alluded to a little bit of this, but um, right now the average growing degree days, I think in Anchorage, it's a little under a thousand hours, I believe above 50 degrees. So, but we're seeing more and more summers like 2019 blew every record out of the water. People start ripening things that they haven't ripened historically. I know out of fire apple orchard, they start ripening one net of plums, which are a hybrid from Minnesota. Historically speaking, they didn't ripen here in South Central Alaska, but that summer they did. Is that something we're going to be able to do more reliably in the future? That's anybody's guess, but it's part of the experiment. I already alluded to the snowpack. The snowpack is honestly your best friend. Um, living, my house is at 1100 feet, so my snowpack is a little more reliable. But where your snowpack blows off, that's where your mulching is going to become more common. And for whatever reason, folks here in Alaska, they don't like to add mulch. Mulch is honestly, that's going to be something we're going to have to shift our mindset to here in Alaska because not only the water retention, but the what uh, breaking down and creating more organics in the soil and also insulating the soil from the extremes when you don't have very much snow cover. Mulch is honestly our best friend. Um, and then when it comes to pets. So we already, we've already seen like every August, people are like, oh, fall's coming early. Look at the birch trees, they're brown. It's not because actually there's fall is coming because the birch trees are not gonna, their, their leaves turn yellow based off of how much accumulated heat and when they broke dormancy in the spring. It has nothing to do with some psychic ability to predict fall. When you see the trees start turning yellow like early in the season, like August, it's actually these birch leaf miners that have been imported from other parts of the world. And basically these worms, if you actually go look at the leaves, there's these little brown trails where the worms are eating the inside of the leaves. And so those those uh, those worms of the leaf miners are fairly harmless. It's not great for the trees long term. But we're seeing more and more pests, not only in our native species, but fruit production. Um, down in World 48, they have a really big problem with a little fruit fly called spotted wing drosophila, or uh, SWD. Um, so, and it's a huge problem because unlike most fruit flies that basically utilize and eat rotting fruit, they actually lay their eggs on fresh fruit, like especially your soft fruits, like your cherries, your grapes, your blueberries, things like that. And then your larvae go in and they basically tunnel in and will actually spoil the fruit, especially with a high enough population density. Well, each summer, the spotted wing drosophila population, which is native to Asia, is working its way further north into North America. And it's already been, they've already had uh, spotted wing drosophila up into Saskatchewan on their uh, Saskatoon and sour cherry crops. So it goes to show that, and they have to have a very rigorous spraying regimen for that. So that's something that we have to kind of start watching out for when we're growing some of these soft roots in Alaska. Will it reach here? I don't know. Hopefully those mountain ranges keep it away because spot winter softball would be the enemy of my food forest, but it just it expresses the importance of diversity. And then microclimates, you guys. I cannot say enough when it comes to a microclimates because yes, here in the Anchorage Bowl nowadays, USDA hardiness zone, you have zone four or a 5A and 5B. So, oh, that tells you I can maybe grow Asian pears. In reality, we don't have enough accumulated growing degree days or heat accumulated in the season to actually harden off that new growth. So a lot of times Asian pears, as soon as it hits 20 degrees in the fall, they didn't go fully dormant because they didn't have enough summer to tell them to go dormant and they'll be dead by the time they reach 20 degrees, even though in a warmer climate or at least warmer summer climate, it would hit negative 30 and that same Asian pear would be fine. So this is where microclimates come in. And actually, if you look at that picture of that beautiful tree right there, surprisingly enough, that's a black walnut in Midtown Anchorage. So, but what's unique about this is that black walnut, if it was planted 10 feet further out from the building or 10 feet to the right, 10 feet to the left, it probably wouldn't be growing. The reason it grows right there is this is a south facing townhome in uh, right off the Seward Highway. There's reflective heat off that south facing wall. It, uh, it thaws earlier in the spring. There's an ambient temperature, it blocks some of the wind, and it allows a little bit of more of a microclimate right there against the building and allows people to this uh, black walnut, which mind you, black walnuts are fairly hardy, but they need more heat to actually harden off their new growth and actually uh, produce nuts. Well, this one produces nuts every year, and it's actually extremely vigorous and healthy because of that little microclimate. It's the same reason in Europe people would train espalier like different fruit trees up against walls. You may live in Britain and you don't have very warm summers, but figs are hardy there. So they would train figs up against the wall and that little bit of heat off the masonry would help ripen figs where they wouldn't out in the open. So, and then microclimates south facing, you're gonna get uh, earlier thaw, you're gonna get more accumulated heat. If you have a tree that breaks dormancy too early and it may be blooming too early in the frost sap of flowers, you find more of a northern uh, or a northerly slope where it's gonna thaw a little slower or even when it comes to elevation, at my house at 1100 feet, I'm at a zone 6A microclimate, but you head a thousand feet lower than me and they're 4B, 5A based off of just the winter minimums because the inversion, you have the cold air settles in the low spots 
and that uh, and then it's a slightly warmer the house it only gets down to about negative 10 where I'm at even though it'll hit negative 25 to negative 30 down below and then also that whether you are at an area where frost will settle or whether you escape the frost that can also determine how long your growing season actually is and how to protect different things mm -hmm. so microclimates reign supreme and honestly there's a lot of potential if you're willing to kind of investigate some of those microclimates next slide please yeah, so, thanks. I'll um, jump in really quick here, Josh, because the, the question in the chat, uh, Margaret had asked about fruit walls. Um, and I think in our in sort of permaculture circles, we we would call that a microclimate, like um, basically growing against walls, which I think you covered it. Do you want to say anything else about fruit walls? I honestly, uh, being able to, because the big thing about permaculture and food forests is being able to utilize space. And I know Saskia probably put a lot of emphasis on talking about uh, be, being able to utilize niches and space and growing different crops within the same space that complement one another. That's where the beauty of get, getting a little creative, those fruit walls are amazing because you're utilizing a space that maybe wouldn't be as productive. Or you, if you can grow your apples like Belgian wall style, it can be multifaceted when it comes to its application. Oh, you use uh, basically a Belgian style uh, apple fence. Not only does that uh, create some sort of barrier, but you're producing food along that plane. And it also opens up space to grow other things, or you can grow other crops in the meantime it, within that space underneath. It opens up sun and penetration and allows that energy of the sun to make it to lower levels so you can grow more food at the lower levels. So honestly, the, there's endless potential when you start thinking about food in that kind of production. You don't have to have a 25 foot apple tree. You can. There's folks in Siberia that they train their apple trees only to be two feet tall because of extreme Siberian winters. Their apple trees may not survive, like large apples may not survive above the snow line. So they train their apples to grow underneath the snow line so they can have their large delicious apples that otherwise would succumb to the Siberian winter. So if that's honestly a potential, if you want to try that up in Fairbanks, if you're willing to protect them from the voles. But there's there's endless potential if you're willing to just kind of experiment with it. And honestly, I think what a lot of people, even like if you're in a little townhouse and you have a crab apple planted in the little median between your driveways, you can graft different varieties onto each branch. Why have one Norland apple that'll produce 50 pounds of apples all at once and then you have to process them all when you can graft different varieties that do uh, ripen at different times and then you could stagger your apple harvest and then it doesn't become overwhelming when every Norland ripens. You now have Chinese early gold that ripens in August and then you have um, Norland that ripens early September and you can have even Zestar ripen the end of September. You can stagger your harvest. So there's so much potential. You learn a couple of tricks and honestly, you can turn any space into an edible space. Um, so actually, I do want to touch on this one. So uh, recent years, it's been amazing. There's been like this renaissance of people recognizing how important our and beautiful our native species are within our landscapes. For so long, people like, oh, we need to plant lilacs. And mind you, I'm not hating on lilacs, but we need to plant lilacs, we need to plant mock oranges, we need to plant these pretty showy ornamental species that are not native here, and then they don't add any value. It's the same reason the maydays were planted here, the Prunus patus. Oh, it's a beautiful, fast-growing ornamental tree that people can plant in their landscapes. Now we're realizing, hey, there may be some problems there. It kind of spreads a little quick here in our biome. So that's where our native species come in. But I've uh, I've kind of encountered exactly probably what you guys have encountered. Native species really aren't available because there aren't many people propagating our native species. So honestly, whether it's you're growing vaccinium oleaginosum, so like our bog blueberries, which mind you, these are only two months old. I'm super stoked about these. Um, or like thimbleberries from Haynes. Um, to I a lot of there's a lot of hate for like cow parsnips or pushki. I think it's it's actually one of my favorite native species because it's a carrot relative. Mind you, everybody has to be aware of the phytophotodermatitis. So don't get the sap on your skin on a sunny day. But when you respect the plant, you go look at one of the umbrella-shaped flowers when it's blooming, you'll have five or six different species of pollinators and flying insects that are pollinating that native plant. Um, every almost every stage of the plant is edible when it's processed properly. And from a permaculture perspective, I use it as like a, a mulch crop or like a, it produces a ton of biomass. So if I have pushki getting too big or too rowdy, I can knock it back, either step on the crown or I can kind of break it up, use it as mulch around some of my other fruit trees. It'll regrow, but then you're cycling the nutrients from those deep tap roots and putting it back down as a mulch. So kind of managing it versus having to get rid of it. Honestly, I would I prefer the cow parsnips, the nettles, the bluebells as an understory for my orchard versus grass. I think grass orchards are kind of boring at, honestly. And seeing the biodiversity work their way into my, my food forest, there's nothing more satisfying. So, and then when it comes to growing our native species, of course, we have our berries and honestly like Saskatoons, I think everybody should have them in their yards, but looking at some of the herbaceous perennials, whether it's your nettles, your bluebells, your pushki, um, your watermelon berries, Honestly, I have the, those are almost the entire understory of my food forest. 
and they like the soil is almost black just from all the biomass just being regenerated each season and cycling back into the, the soil profile or the soil horizons the soil just it continues to just fill that soil and it doesn't compact because you're just having that cycling of nutrients and so honestly i think incorporating native species whether it's a more manicured like uh, controlled like native garden or if it's just an entire just wild food forest like mine i think our native species belong in every landscape next slide please so um, we talked about some of the different trials that we're going to be, some of the things. So if you look in those pots off to the right, at the bottom, that's Castanea dentata, also known as your American chestnut. And then up above that, that's Jocelyn's Regio, which is your English walnut. And both of those have already overwintered in those pots, so they're actually rather hardy. But something we talk about when it comes to longer growing seasons is you go back to the early 1900s, there's a lot of things that didn't ripen then that ripen now. Like, I don't think a Zestar apple, if a Zestar had existed back in the early 1900s, would have ripened in Palmer or uh, Anchorage. But nowadays, Zestar is actually fairly reliable in ripening the tail end of the apple season late September. So it goes to show that there is more potential. Some people are even quasi, I don't want to say an edible Honeycrisp apple, but some people are actually ripening Honeycrisp to the point where it's almost an edible apple. That's progress. So, because typically we need about another month of warm growing season for them to properly ripen, but some people are getting them to the point where you can at least make a slaw out of them, which that's progress. But growing degree days, adding additional heat to the growing season, historically speaking, like a lot of people didn't even, even sour cherries weren't necessarily the most reliable when it came to ripening in the early 1900s. Now Evans is in almost everybody's yard, rightfully so. Um, it's that accumulated growing degree days that more heat in the longer growing season, it opens up our parameters. And, Honestly, some of the nuts I don't think are very far off, especially if you can find that really favorable microclimate that adds just a little bit of extra protection, a little bit of additional heat. And what a lot of people don't realize is like uh, a black walnut per se, there's black walnuts that grow up in the northern Alberta that are hardy to zone two, hardy to negative 50. So you ask yourself, well, why aren't those black walnuts growing in the Anchorage area where we're like banana belt compared to that? It's that growing degrees. Not only do you need more heat for to ripen the fruits, but there's some trees like your walnuts or your, or your Asian pears that need more heat to actually finish their growth cycle in a full season. Because you could have the hardiest apple on the planet or the hardiest pear on the planet. If it doesn't fully harden off at the end of the season and basically it's caught with its pants down and the temperatures drop before it's initiated that terminal bud and started the shutdown sequence, your tree will either be damaged or killed outright when in reality, if you can get it to harden off earlier or a different rootstock or maybe a warmer microclimate where it helps it accumulate more growing degree days and harden off more adequately, your tree's more apt to survive. So that's where those microclimates come in. And then also the microclimates help with ripening fruit too. So you have the best black walnut in the world, it survives, but if it's not ripening nuts, it's just a novelty at that point. Um, something, again, this year, maybe not the year to talk about, it, but we saw the upgrade when it came to the USDA hardiness zones and the overall trend is warmer, warmer winters, we're getting less extremes. And mind you, everybody got ranked up to zone five and now we're getting temperatures in the uh, negative twenties. So it goes to show that it's an average, not necessarily doesn't account for extreme events. But in reality, our winters are not as extreme as they used to be. And we're seeing more and more like long, mild stretches it, it interspersed with some pretty extreme cold events. But it goes to show like sweet cherries 25 years ago, nobody would have even thought of except the sweet cherries here in South Central Alaska. Coming from Fairbanks, I'm like, I got to try them because now I'm in the banana belt. And honestly, my style of sweet cherry never dies back. It's fully hardy at my location in Chugiak. A rootstock is very important there, but it turns out that um, having less of those cold extreme events and also taking advantage of microclimates and maybe different orientations on the slope and different locations, you can get some of these species to maybe survive more adequately or maybe they're sheltered from the more extreme cold. And honestly, another example of that would be snow cover. If you have a shrub that's growing underneath the snow cover, there's an entire different microclimate that, grow, that will survive under that snow cover versus what's exposed to ambient air temperature. Wait, I've seen zone eight blackberries grown up in Fairbanks zone one because of that snow cover. It's amazing what the insulation value is of snow. Um, and then when it comes to like, and then extreme cold events, there's some that um, like your English or your uh, European hazelnut, they're in theory fairly hardy here in South Central Alaska. They're typically hardy to about negative 20. So some of the warmer areas, the problem is, is their flower buds are much more sensitive and they typically are damaged at a much warmer temperature than the outright tree. So you can have an awesome, beautiful ornamental tree, but if it doesn't bloom, it's kind of a waste of space, at least for me personally, if you want to have an ornamental hazelnut by all means. But it just, just that's something to consider where cold, uh, warmer cold or warmer uh, winter extremes can help maybe um, some of the flower buds actually survive on some of these marginal species and thus fruit and nut production. So, and then again, like I talked about earlier, these are trends, but there will always be extremes and outliers. Never put all your eggs in one basket. Don't invest in an almond 
don't invest in an almond orchard here in South Central Alaska quite yet. I get them to survive, but it's all it takes is that one winter to kind of humble me. So it's something to remember. Next slide, please. So, um, and actually there's, so when we talk about uh, trialing new species in a, like actually up there, that picture right there, I'm super proud of that. That's on my five-year-old Rainier sweet cherry. So that usually blows a lot of people's minds. And then on the left, that's a valiant grape. And then in the middle, that's a seed laying Manchurian apricot from a local tree. Um, there's other variables you can take into consideration when you're growing different species within your space to kind of maybe stack the odds in your favor. Not only microclimates where you take advantage of a warm wall or a northern orientation where it's going to bloom a little later, things of that nature, but you can also use different uh, seed sources and rootstocks because like this Manchurian apricot right here in the middle is from a local Manchurian. I did, I grew 25 of those seedlings, not a single one died, they're fully hardy here, but you buy a bundle of Manchurian apricots that were sourced from seeds maybe down in North Dakota, Minnesota and brought up here, I lost about 25% of them. So it goes to show that seed source can actually make a meaningful difference on whether something's gonna survive or not. So if like here in Alaska, if I'm trying to push the bounds of what's growing here, I try to find what the northernmost seed source of a given plant and then try to bring it a little further north. With like the sweet cherry, it's actually rootstock. Because surprisingly enough, because when it comes to a tree, they're grafted. So you're gonna have different roots from the cultivar on top. Every rainier cherry is genetically identical, but the roots are gonna be different. So most sweet cherries are grafted on like diff on sweet cherry rootstock like Mazurg or Mahalab. And they're not necessarily the most hardy and they don't induce early dormancy, but there's this Russian rootstock called Crimps 5. And what's neat about it is it actually induces early season dormancy, causes the tree to go to bed two weeks earlier than the sweet cherry on any other rootstock. And you get great survival when it's grafted on Crimps 5 versus any of the other rootstocks. So that's something to actually consider. Actually, one of my prime examples is I have an almond that's actually grafted on an aching cherry and it's going on three years old. And it's a true almond, not the Russian. So it goes to show that if you can find the rootstock and a hardy genetic, maybe something that's fairly hardy, even where it's grown, you may actually have potential of pushing something a little further north. And then, like I said before, site selection is absolutely paramount because microclimates can truly make the difference. That black hole that planted 10 feet out probably wouldn't be alive right now. So it goes to show how much that can impact. Next slide, please. Oh, maybe. <laughs> And hang on, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'll stop you there, actually, because uh, just about site selection. Um, let's see. Going back through the comments, someone was asking about places where there's really rocky soil. How, how can you? What, what do you recommend? You know, for building up soil in places where you basically have glacial moraine. So I. I'm not, we heard the old adage of a, a $100 hole for a $10 tree. I'm not a fan of that because a lot of modern tree planting science indicates that you add too many nutrients and you amend your soil too much. And what it's going to do is it's basically the roots are going to prep or the, it, they're going to be, they're going to love that spot. They're going to grow like weeds, but they're not going to send the long roots out, basically having to work their way into the native soil. And you have a tree that either has a re, uh, weak root system or it's just going to sit there and pout for years. So I have minimal amendments. Um, if anything, you maybe mix some organic material in just so it has some water retention. And then after that, mulch. I know a lot of people here in Alaska don't like mulch because mulch insulates the soil and people, there's a notion that it keeps cold and it attracts vermin. Whereas the reality is, is if you live in Alaska, voles are gonna be there. So protecting your tree from voles is paramount. But honestly, wood chip mulch is one of the best things we can do. Mind you, don't put too much because it will insulate the soil. But adding one to two inches of wood chip mulch it basically slowly the microbes and the fungi that exist will start breaking down those wood chips and cycling the nutrients into the soil profile and as years go on you end up building fertile soil just kind of like the forest around here if you go into any patch of birch forest around here locally and go dig underneath the forest up there's actually a rich organic layer and some of it's even getting cycled into the soil horizons but if you have open areas where that organic material is not building up like a lawn it doesn't really build up and you don't really build a whole lot of fertility so Minimal amendments, maybe some basic organic material to begin with, and then mulches. I think mulches are always our best bet. And when you plant a tree, it's better for it to be a little slower in the beginning and work into that native soil because you'll have a more resilient tree in the long run. And those mulches will break down and make nutrients bioavailable. Yeah. Hopefully that answered your question. I, I think so. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and I will say um, we also have some webinars about, um, you know, making your own soil, even in, if you're in rural Alaska and how you can Absolutely. source locally. Um, grown materials. We can put that in the chat too. And there's another question about soils. Um, Kathleen is asking about berries and how they, um, it often, you know, the common knowledge is that they need a lower pH um, in order to grow. Maybe our native plants are more adapted to grow in different ones, but she's asking, um, do you use peat moss for germinating? Do you ever grow in the ground? Do you ever germinate in the ground? 
So actually, yes, to answer all of that. Um, so I do use peat moss. And again, I'm trying to work my way off of peat moss because we know, again, it's not just the most sustainable because peat moss is a stable carbon sump right now. And by using it, you're releasing that carbon into the atmosphere. I'm trying to get away from that. I'm not a big fan of core, so I'm trying to find a new replacement. But um, I do use peat moss for my vaccinium species or your blueberries and huckleberries because they do like more acidic soils. Um, I, you can start your vacciniums outside. Actually, Jaime uh, with Al the Alpine Nursery out in Wasilla, he grew vaccinium lignosum from seed. The problem is when you do it outside, it is very, very slow. You're looking at a plant, before the plant is two to three inches tall, you're looking at years. While I can grow one that's a couple inches tall in the span of a couple months. It just being indoors under grow lights makes a big difference. But if you are a patient human, hope probably more patient than myself, you can definitely grow them outdoors and they will be adapted and they will, as time goes on, you'll end up with a big berry patch. But it's you're looking at many, many years, possibly decades before you see your first production. You can expedite that by starting them indoors. But if you're like trying to plant, actually, I Patricia Holloway up in Fairbanks, she was gem, uh, generating or she was germinating vaccine melaginosum for years. And they started experimenting with maybe some of the cultural requirements and expanding berry patches up in the interior. And she actually came to find that the eulignosum was actually much more resilient to even bare mineral soil. It was actually, there's the notion it has to grow in pure like peat hammocks and things like that. She was planting it in just the, the Tanana uh, silt and losa growth that's up there. And it was doing just fine. So I always, when I plant my vaccinians, I do amend the soil where I'll mix in like rotted spruce bark and like old spruce logs and organic material to help uh, hold moisture there because I'm lazy, I don't want to water every day. But in reality, it's not a whole lot more. You can add the acidic, uh, the acidic lovers fertilizer, things of that nature. The sulfur will help drop the pH. But in reality, most of our soils are not, they're usually fairly neutral, if not trending on the acidic side anyway. So it usually doesn't take a whole lot to even amend the soils just for blueberries. Um, blueberries, I will amend the soil just a little bit because it's a shrub and they're happier, but when it comes to trees, I don't I try not to amend the soil at all. So does that answer the question? I know that was kind of word vomit. I think so. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> Kathleen's satisfied. Great. Thank you, Josh. So, absolutely. And honestly, this is more just show and tell, kind of showing what you can do when you start thinking outside the box of growing new species here in Alaska. On the left-hand side right there, that's Juglans regia, also known as an English walnut. It's going on three years old. And the first year I planted it, it was fully green in the fall. The snow stripped the leaves off. I'm like, yeah, I think yeah, there's not a chance. Well, it actually not only survived, but it actually parted off some of the growth from that season. I'm like, well, that's interesting. I have it in kind of a dry spot where I don't give it a whole lot of fertilizer. That second year, it, it almost like it figured Alaska out. It's like, ooh, fall's coming. So in late September, it was fully yellow. And by early October, when the snow was ready to fly, it, all the leaves were gone. So the tree that hadn't figured it out the first year, it figured it out by the second year, and it figured out that winter was coming and went fully dormant. So that Juglans regia now has the best possible opportunity of surviving the winter in Alaska because it's fully dormant versus that one that wasn't fully dormant and probably was going to be pretty heavily damaged. So if you can keep trees alive for a couple of years, a lot of times they'll kind of start figuring it out and they'll kind of get more adapted as time goes on. And an older tree of something that's marginal will be more resilient to like outlier weather events versus a young tree. So kind of keeping them protected and maybe a microclimate and helping get them through those first couple of years can, uh, that can lend itself to overall survival in the long run. In the middle right here, this is why we're planting hazelnuts in uh, Anchorage area in Palmer and Fairbanks, because this is Corliss cornuta. These are beet hazelnuts. So last year I didn't manage to get any because the squirrel beat me to it. I was, I went to go visit Doug and they were still green. So I'm like, okay, I'll wait for them to brown a little bit. By the next time I came, the squirrels had raided all of them. But he's down in South Anchorage and he has uh, probably a half a dozen hazelnut bushes of the Corliss cornuta. He also has American hazelnut, Manchurian hazelnut. And so we're, that's why we start planting experimental hazelnut plantings. This year I got lucky enough in that I beat the squirrels to them. I managed to pick about 50 hazelnuts and I have about 25 of those germinated and growing in uh, uh, nursery plug trays at the house right now. Hopefully gonna distribute those at the research plantings in Fairbanks and uh, in Palmer so we can kind of uh, we can expand upon the hardy genetics of the hazelnuts we're growing here in Alaska and make them more uh, resilient to the, the harsh cold and also earlier ripening. And then right here, this is actually, it just showcases when it comes to um, grafting, this is a Stella sweet cherry grafted on Prunus mockeye or your Amur choke cherry. So um, Amur choke cherries are ornamental that's planted all around uh, South Central Alaska. And there may be some long-term um, incompatibility issues, but I could end up in having a sweet cherry that grows 25, 30, 35 years and it'll be fully hardy on that rootstock on something that somebody's planting in their yard anyway. I got to see an amazing 25 foot sweet cherry grafted on Prunus mockeye down in South Anchorage and it produces fruit every year. 
So it just goes to show that like uh, the choke cherries everybody has in their yards, you can graft plums onto those if you want. And so that's something we're experimenting with too, see if we can help people convert their choke cherries into plums and whether they need nurse branches or not. But that's kind of part of the experiment. But if you can think outside the box, that's a hardy rootstock that's already growing here. Let's convert it into food. And that's what we're doing. Next slide, please. So um, this is actually, and so there's been a lot, I get, a, a, I have a lot of important conversations with folks because people know I'm growing different species that aren't necessarily native to Alaska and invasive species are on everybody's um, radar right now, rightfully so. We've seen what uh, Prunus patis, the European bird cherry, has done to the riparian environments in South Central Alaska. The bird vetch that invades all the, the, the road, the edges of the roads and into fields and uh, cattle fodder, fodder. Uh So we've seen what invasive species can do here in Alaska. It's even more pronounced in more temperate climates. So when we're planting these new species, we have to evaluate whether, okay, we're planting a problem. Like right up here um, in that picture, that's a wild treasure blackberry, zone eight blackberry that I grow in Fairbanks and down here in Anchorage because it survives along the ground. But people see that and they're like, oh, Himalayan blackberry, you can't be growing blackberries. This one right here has Rubus or sinus in its lineage, so the little low growing cascade blackberries. Even in its native climate, it's not going to go invade any uh, location. It's going to grow along the ground and occupy little niches versus take over an entire ecosystem. But I would never, I don't think I could get a Himalayan blackberry to survive here, even if I want to, but I'll never do it because I don't want to run the risk of repeating what happened in the Pacific Northwest here in Alaska. So it's just, you have to kind of evaluate, do they have, uh, do they have the evolutionary characteristics that are necessary for some of these to actually invade our, our, uh, our environment? And I'll kind of touch on that a little bit more. I'll do some compare and contrast. Next slide, please. So this is actually, I want to do compare and contrast because people think hazelnuts, what if they invade our local ecosystems? Well, I want to compare the evolutionary characteristics of Prunus patis with your coral species or your hazelnut species. So Prunus patis, it's a species that grows in the boreal biome, but over in Russia and Northern Europe, it's extremely well adapted, it's extremely hardy. The trees produce vast quantities of fruit that you have to figure when a bird eats the fruit, the seed passes harmlessly through the bird. There's So the seed is meant to pass through the bird, hence bird cherry. So the bird, you can have a small songbird go eat 20 of those cherries, fly 20 miles, deposit them. They have a short cold stratification requirement. So those seeds that were eaten that fall, they fall in the winter or the, the forest stuff. That following spring, they're germinating. They grow extremely rapidly because they're very well adapted to our local climate. And then they start producing very quick, quickly. And then they start... The, then they start producing vast quantities of fruit, which just perpetuates the spread of this species. And then because it's a prunus species, you get some of the phytocyanide that will build up in the branch specifically when it's cold. And then you start ending up with ungulates that over browse these choke cherries and end up dying from cyanide poisoning. So that's why maydays are so, they've become so problematic here in Alaska. But you look at hazelnuts, first and foremost, they're not as well adapted here. We're kind of pushing the northern edge of whether they can be grown or cannot be grown. Then next, the seeds are much larger. So you can't have a, a robin come in and eat 20 hazelnuts and then go deposit them. What they're going to do is you may have like a gray jay or a stellar jay take some of those and go bury them and go stash them on the edge of the fields. And if that hazelnut's not planted in the most favorable location, let's say they put it in a shady spot, it'll never do anything. It'll just sit there and kind of pout if, if it does germinate, assuming a rodent doesn't eat it. Um, if it does find a good spot where it has adequate moisture and adequate sun and it does grow, well, they require wind pollination. So you have to have two of these growing right next to each other in order to get any sort of hazelnuts to produce. So unlike your choke cherry over here, which just is ready, primed and ready to invade our local ecosystem, these hazelnuts, they just don't have the evolutionary characteristics. That's the same with a lot. It's the same reason we don't have Evans cherries and domestic apples invading our local ecosystems. The fruits are too large, and when you don't get that bird distribution, you just don't get a whole lot of seedlings, and you don't get a whole lot of seeds stashed in the seed bank. So I'm not saying that there's a blank check to bring in every non-native species I'm planting it here in Alaska, but we can respectfully and carefully bring some edible species in if they lack those characteristics and maybe help produce a more diversified food system here in the state of Alaska. So hopefully that made sense. And also, if a hazelnut does plant itself on the edge of a field, they're related to birch and alder, so a moose can browse it to its heart's content, and it, honestly, the hazelnut will be the only loser out of that. The moose will have a full tummy from hazelnuts. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so that's a great uh, segue into another question. Absolutely. My mouth is watering thinking about hazelnuts. Uh, and I want, like, I bet everybody on, on the webinar today wants a hazelnut plant. Uh, Shelly asks, how do they do in the wind? So actually, they hazelnuts, the, the reason we start with hazelnuts here in Alaska is, honestly, they are one of the most climate resilient nuts. First and foremost, they're growing farther north than pretty much any other nut currently. There's wild type hazelnuts that literally grow native up into northern Alberta. 
And so they're extremely resilient to heat and to cold, to drought, to wet. And so there's folks in the Midwest that are actually experimenting with growing alley crops of uh, conventional crops in between rows of hazelnuts, and it allows uh, farmers to uh, basically diversify their crops and then perennial plantings, reducing erosion. But the thing is, is these hazelnuts, like uh, the hazelnuts we're growing typically are hybrids between Corlys avalon and Corlys americana, so your European filbert and your American hazelnut. The American hazelnut is a thicket species that literally grows into North Dakota and Minnesota as is. So it's extremely resilient to wind, heat, cold. I don't think these things can technically really be killed. So they're honestly, they're extremely resilient to whatever, if they can survive in North Dakota and those weather and that, the, the wind and the, the, the heat and the cold and the flooding and the dry, I think they'll do just fine here. And so our experiment or our experience so far is uh, hazelnuts we planted in the valley have been fine with the wind. And there's some hazelnuts in the valley that are going on 15 years old and haven't had any problems yet. I think finding those ones that are uh, especially adapted uh, because a lot of uh, hazelnuts we're growing are from seed. So there's going to be variability from seedling to seedling, especially with these being hybrids. You'll have some that'll get 20 feet tall, some that only get six feet tall, some that sucker, some that don't, some that are hardy, some that are not, some that are resistant to eastern filter blight, some that are not. So there will be variability from seedling to seedling. If you want to try growing hazelnuts here in Alaska, the best way is avoid buying cultivars for now. We want to find seedlings that are better adapted. So you're better off planting 10 seedlings and seeing how they do, and maybe a couple of them will be more adapted to your climate. You may have one that's not happy in the wind. You'll have others growing right next to it that are perfectly content with whatever Palmer or Wassell grows at. So does that answer your question? Yeah. And I, I'm going to uh, drop in another question that's not quite as related, but um, what do you think about using uh, greenhouses, high tunnels for some, you know getting some of these um, plants growing that need a little bit of extra heat? 100%. Honestly, I think uh, the high tunnel, especially the high tunnel program that's utilized specifically on the Kenai Peninsula, I think it's a game changer when it comes to agriculture here in Alaska. But that a little bit of accumulated heat, I think from a nursery perspective, I'm going to be using some low tunnels. Well, I can grow the hazelnuts outdoors and they'll be just fine. If I can grow them in a low tunnel, I'll get more growth out of them to harden off better. Maybe I'll get less dieback those first couple of years because they're going to get enough heat to harden off that new growth. So I think when it comes to growing some of these, especially if you're growing plants to be planted out in the field, or even if you're just... For whatever reason, if you want to use high tunnel space to grow hazelnuts, I think it's a great opportunity. We talk about microclimates. Literally, the greenhouse is the ultimate microclimate when it comes to more growing degree days. And also, if you seal up a high tunnel and you leave the plastic out, mind you, you run the risk of it collapsing in the winter snows. But if you can keep it up during the winter, you can have two to three like hardening zones warmer. Like I want to say Boyer's Nursery in South Anchorage, they talk about inside their high tunnel, it almost being a zone 7A microclimate versus the surrounding area being zone 4, zone 5. So they have methylene plums and uh, beauty plums and reliance peaches growing inside their high tunnel when outdoors that they wouldn't stand a chance. So honestly, microclimates, whether you're using a greenhouse or using a wall or using a different slope orientation, uh, microclimates abound. And I think there's endless potential there. And I think they should be utilized when you have that opportunity. So um, some of the projects, um, the future crops initiative, honestly, I touched on this one earlier, but I'm so proud of this one. And again, when uh, Glenda and Katie planted some of the hazelnuts up in Fairbanks, it really just go, it went to show like, hey, th this is actually a thing. So uh, we're starting with the hazelnuts. We planted 150 in Palmer, planted 100 up in Fairbanks. We're hoping to work with uh, different uh, villages and towns in rural Alaska to hopefully expand these trials to different microclimates. Because if we find a hazelnut that grows well in Palmer, cool. That's our microclimate in Palmer, we can select it for there. But that doesn't tell us anything about how it does in Fairbanks or how it does in Panama or Fort Yukon. So we're hoping to kind of branch out and hopefully and then share data back and forth. Maybe we can find some hardy hybrids and then cross with pollen, send pollen to Fort Yukon to pollinate one if they haven't survived. And so it's it's going to be kind of a community science project as we go on, but we want to expand. Because you look at this picture right here, that's Juglum's Manchurica. These are ripe walnuts that were grown in Anchorage. So right now we have, I've seen butternuts, I've seen Manchurian walnuts, and I've seen black walnuts all growing in the Anchorage area with no problem. The Manchurians are the ones that ripen every year, but even the butternuts and black walnuts are getting pretty close some summers. So uh, we want to expand to other species as well. I have a, a gentleman who sent me a bunch of American chestnuts. He's up in northern Wisconsin, zone 3B, 4A, where he's at. And he's been growing uh, American chestnuts in his property for 30 years. He planted 100 trees. And Wisconsin killed all but four of the seedlings out of 100. And now those four seedlings are 25 feet tall producing uh, chestnuts. So he sent me chestnuts from those trees. And he also happened to be in a blight free location, at least in the meantime. So we bring those up here out of basically those four parents are hardier than the other uh, 96. So in theory, there will be some hardier genetics in these seedlings. And we're going to be planting them up here. But the goal is um, we want to expand because for far too long, 
when you look at the different apple cultivars, whether you're Honeycrisp, your Zestar, your uh, Norland, these were all bred in other locations. Your Norland was bred in Canada, your Zestar was bred in Minnesota. A lot of the cultivars of fruit that we associate with growing here, Alaska Evans cherry was found in a backyard in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, for far too long, we've relied on other cold regions to select our fruit. And basically we're planting them from other areas and it's always a guess, we bring a new one in, is it gonna grow here? Is it gonna survive? Is it gonna ripen? You know, it's nobody, nobody knows until they plant it. Well, we wanna change that dialogue and we wanna change that research, like that thought process, by we're gonna start breeding fruits and nuts for Alaska's conditions here in Alaska. And that's what the Future Crops Initiative is about. It's a community science project and hopefully in 50 years, we'll be able to look back and be like, hey, look at all the apples we released, the apricots, the plums, the pears, walnuts, chestnuts, hazelnuts, and hopefully result in a more resilient Alaska when it comes to growing more food for the food systems here. And we can uh, develop more Alaskan cultivars for Alaskans. So that's that's the goal of the Future Crops Initiative. I'm really excited. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity, come visit us out at the Mountain Music Experiment Farm because that hazelnut planting is really neat to see. Um, so let's see. Um, and I talked about how we're teaming up. Um, the Robartic Agriculture Project is another piece to the Future Crops Initiative because we not only planted a plot of hazelnuts there, which is on the state fair, but we're bringing the state fair in on the project as well. And then we're going to be experimenting. We want to develop an apple cultivar there for our friend Sharon. Um, so we're going to be starting to select those. We're going to grow a bunch of apple seedlings from improved apple cultivars, uh, basically at two years old, cut them off and graft them onto established trees. And then from there, we can start releasing apples. But it goes to show the future crops initiative, it's going to have, it's going to kind of be an overarching web of uh, uh, different uh, tribal groups and different uh, business groups like farms and the state fair and then the university system and hopefully between all those entities even the the kids covered working with Milena and possibly incorporating their pro their property and the kids in with the research and maybe various schools around the state we can uh, all work together as a community to develop more fruits and nuts for Alaskans so that's that's why I'm so excited about the future crops initiative and it's just going to hopefully it's going to be something that really brings about a new uh, conversation regarding food systems here in Alaska. So, um, and then I already talked on the food force when it comes to Robarchuk. So next slide, please. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> so um, when we talk about adapting the fruits and like trees and things like that, that when it comes to growing here in Alaska, the old adage of a hundred dollar hole for a ten dollar tree, I despise that adage because again, it doesn't result in a very resilient tree. It will grow like crazy for a couple of years, but it doesn't actually um, result in a very long lived tree or very healthy tree. We're learning more and more that using your native soils. So there's a whole, like even uh, back in the day, they said mix bone meal in with the planting coal when you plant trees. Well, there's some research coming out of Oregon where they say the phosphorus from the bone meal will actually inhibit the initial growth of the mycorrhizae fungi, which basically it creates a symbiotic relationship with fungi and the roots and the soil, making nutrients available through the soil. Um, so more and more, it's looking like we're going to have to use our native soils and use mulches, using organic mulches on the top that break down and get cycled into the soil profile through fungi and microbes and things of that nature. So um, they talk about like over there on the left hand side, that was an example of planting a tree. Um, a lot of times you see people plant trees like in, even in nursery pots and you just see the trunk going right into the ground. That gives me anxiety. Or if you've ever been lower 48 and you've seen the mulch volcanoes where the mulch is piled up against the trunks. It literally makes me want to go fight people because it's slowly suffocating that tree. There's a gaseous exchange right there at the flare of the roots. So if you look at that picture on the left, planting the tree so there's a you actually have the flare of the roots exposed. That's really important. And then you mulch like a donut around the tree. But mulching is probably one of the best things we can start doing in a practice we can kind of start adapting to here in Alaska. Wood chips, leaves, things of that nature. Because not only are you building your soil slowly and um, making creating a beneficial environment for your fungi and your microbes to make nutrients bioavailable for your tree in the soil profile, but if we start having those winters where we're having low snow or the freeze thaws, mulch is what's going to keep those roots frozen in the winter versus thawing, freezing, thawing, freezing, and if losing trees that would otherwise be party. I think mulching is one of the best things we could be doing, and not just when it comes to your trees, but in your gardens. I'm a lazy gardener. I don't want to go out and have to water every day. I don't want to have to weed every day. So I go in and I, as soon as everything gets going in the spring and warmed up, I put some of my old goat bedding down. I'll put leaves down. Wood chips break down a little slow for my liking in the garden, but there are applications. But honestly, I think the mulches are the best way to go and you'll conserve moisture, you'll build fertility, and you'll reduce weed pressure. I think, uh, especially when it comes to home gardens, it, I think tilling is actually, you're just cycling seeds, the seed bank up. I'm not a big fan of the practice. I'm more apt to use the no-till method, teach their own, but I'm a big fan of mulches for that reason because I'm a lazy gardener. And I think that's, that kind of cycles back to the whole idea of a food forest. That's why food forests are so, um, that's why they, 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 they look so good because, or that's why they um, are so 
I can't think of the word, you guys. That's why they there there's so much appreciation for food food forest because once you get it established, there's some stewardship and there's some maintenance, but overall there's a lot less maintenance in the long run because you're allowing the natural systems and the 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 you're using the different levels and the different using different layers of organic material and you're using um, the environment around you to basically create a system versus having to fight the system to grow your fruit. So. Um, uh, targeted irrigation people back in the day people were like let's just spray everything with water. okay sorry um so and then targeted irrigation again here in, in the anchorage area we only average 16 to 17 inches of rain a year and that even gets or water period a year and that even gets to be less when you get into the rain shadow up in the math too so it goes to show most fruit trees need about an inch of water a, a, a week so in reality targeted irrigation is one of the best things you do it just makes sense to spray a whole lawn when you have one apple tree but if you can use some sort of drip irrigation or target your uh your water in the root zone of that fruit tree that's going to be beneficial and then microclimates these are all ways you can adapt to your basically how you're growing some of these things and how you're going to utilize your spaces to produce a more resilient end product next slide please let's see and then the biggest piece of advice, if you want to be an experimental fruit grower or food forest, if you go to Bell's Nursery, you go to buy a, a seven foot apple tree, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. It's expensive. So one of the best things I could say, whether you're trying to grow your native bog blueberries, or if you're trying to grow, uh, grow apple trees, or if you want to grow currants and gooseberries or Saskatoons, learn how to propagate. So apples, like the first time I learned to graft apples with Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association, I got 50% take. And then after that, every apple tree I grafted took. It's actually really easy to get apples to graft is once you learn the technique. Currants and gooseberries, they root readily from uh, cuttings. I can get 100% rooting uh, when it comes to kiwis even here in Alaska, just with using bottom heat, growing things from seed, you, learning the process when it comes to stratification and germination, there's, it opens up the potential and it makes uh, experimentation more worthwhile because instead of risking that seven foot apple tree that you spent $150 on and may not be hardy, you graft a little piece of it. And if it dies, you're out three to $5. So honestly, I'm all about being economical and it allows you to really push the bounds even further if you don't have a whole lot of uh, financial loss in the process. Next slide, please. So I guess to kind of cycle back, um, I think with the current, uh, I, I, I talked with Jody and Jody actually pointed out that she doesn't like the term food security because it kind of, it's a misnomer. People think, oh, I'm food secure. I can go to Freddy's and buy food. We need to be talking about the food systems here in Alaska because uh, we saw that we are the end of the supply chain here in Alaska and our shelves go empty before anywhere else. So when there's hiccups in the world. So the more we can produce in Alaska by Alaskans, whether it's within our space, within community gardens, whether it's in parks or if it's farmers and supporting Alaska farmers, the more we're producing by Alaskans for Alaskans, the better off we are in Alaska. And reality is with climate change, there will be some winters where we're having more growing degree days, where we're going to have more heat, longer growing seasons, where we can grow more. But there will also be challenges where a lot of people here in Alaska sustain on subsistence uh, picking of native berries. You start having changes in the climate. You start having declines in berry production based off of years. So in reality, there is a trade off there. So the more we can be growing within our spaces and the more we can be diversifying the food we're growing here in Alaska, the more resilient we'll be in the future. So, and in the words of Doug Trick, if you want to try, uh, never accept no whether something's going to survive here in Alaska, let Alaska determine that for you. If you're not afraid to kill it, give it a try. So, but with that, I guess I'll turn it over. Are there any questions? I know I just gave you guys an hour of word vomit. <laughs> that was awesome, Josh. Um, we, we always love hearing from you. It's really inspirational. And I, at this point, um, I, I know I missed a few questions. So you can go ahead and unmute your ask if there's something you would like to hear from or like Josh to answer. All right. I have a question, a Josh, but it, it was really great as always. And um, I would love to see more presentations like this, even at Rabarchik. And yeah, I would love to see the, you know, do a plant mail or something. Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> We'll have to do we'll have to do more events in the food forest this year at Rabarchek. So I really want to showcase like what we're doing there because it's really neat. Yeah, we're we're having a planning session soon. So yeah, definitely. Um, I have a question. Um, if because I'm down in Ketchikan, but seven something. I never remember if seven A or B. Um, I guess it depends a little bit too. But is there do you have things available? that would really truly work well here because of our excessive rainfall, which is really what 
causes a lot of problems and people just don't understand, especially with the rain coming at the wrong time or the wind coming at the wrong time for blossoms and for ripening fruit, because I would like to be able to get a good list of um, the of our the fruit trees that would work here because I am working on a lot of um, parent, I'm, I'm really specializing with what I'm doing with perennial food crops and helping people understand that fruit trees and berry bushes are perennial food plants. Yep. I, I'll have to work on that list for you, but I know um, I was speaking one gentleman down in Ketchikan and of course drainage is a big issue. So you have to, to figure out your drainage issue, but there's folks down in Ketchikan that are ripening methylene plums and Honestly, I was really surprised. They said one of the most uh, recommended fruits down Ketchikan is your Imperial Epineus French prune, which I got to survive in Chugiak. I was super stoked. It's super marginal where I'm at, but it's fully hardy in Ketchikan. It's self-fertile, so pollination is less of an issue, and it's uh, and it produces fruit that ripens reliably early in the season. So even though Ketchikan, you have a really long growing season, it's a cool rainy growing season, so you're going to have to add more days to getting fruit to ripen. So you still have to plant things that ripen fairly early, even if you have a longer growing season than we do. Folks up in Fairbanks, they have even a shorter growing season, but they're able to ripen some plums that we cannot. So I'll have to work on that list. I know there's some folks in Ketchikan that are growing some awesome fruits, but the pollination issue in the spring, I'm not 100% certain. I know there's some folks that are even growing some awesome early pears in like Sitka, but I would have to do more research into that one. So if when you get more of it, will you have it like on your website or something? Because I, I'm, I am working with some other people and I'm doing a lot of work as a local food leader to help mm -hmm. increase... Um, awareness about agriculture locally Absolutely. so i really you know anything that we can share would be super because i'm this is part of what i'm supposed to be doing down here so thanks Absolutely. a lot i i'll, I'll see uh, i'll try to talk to some folks because i know at least one fruit grower that lives down there i'll talk to him with his experience i don't know what um i, I could probably share that on my bear mountain forest nursery uh, facebook page i'll probably make some sort of reel out of it eventually but um, I will try to share that information as soon as I have it. I know I'm speaking with one gentleman. Um, we're going to be experimenting. We're sending some hazelnuts down there this spring. So they can. we're going to actually be leading more towards European hazelnuts, like your Yom Hill seedlings. But um, again, it's down in Ketchikan. Just like, even though you guys are much warmer in the banana belt, you guys have your own challenges. And you guys are kind of on the front edge of being pioneers in that capacity. So I'll try to figure out what I can find out and then I'll try to share that with you. But a lot of it's just going to be people are going to have to figure out what they're growing. And again, what works for one neighbor may not work for the other, but that's part of the experiment. But as soon as I have more information, I'll get that out on my Fairmount Forest Nursery page. Yeah, Mary, I, I suggest you follow Josh on some of his social media channels. I know the link was in the chat, but you can do uh, Bear Mountain Forest Nursery on Facebook. And I also just put in the, um, the chat the Alaska Pioneer Fruit Growers Association, oh. which is a great resource. And I'm sure there's members in your area. And I see Annette has her hand up. Go ahead, Annette. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you for all this great info. Um, my question is, how do you determine when or what to give and and what to keep for yourself so like I'm a helper and I'm just getting started but I can already anticipate people are going to be like can I have it and I'm going to be like yeah sure and then I'll look and I'll have nothing left so how do you determine when they're ready to go? I'm really bad at capitalism so I don't know like in theory I'm supposed to sell these plants and every time I give like a pitch of, oh, Bear Mountain Forest Nursery, it's like, oh, I'm trying to sell people something. I'm terrible at that. If I could just give away all the plants to happy homes, that would be like way, I'd be way happier that way. I just realized like, I'm probably not the most sustainable practice. Um, it's gonna have to be something where I always try to grow extras and I do try to afford the opportunity to share, especially those who maybe aren't in a position to maybe, or they're not in a financial position or they're not in um, the socio, they're not in a position period to maybe go procure it or buy it outright. I'll try to find a way to kind of get them those, or honestly, young people. When I, when I meet like a 14 year old who's super passionate about some of these plants, I will just give them plants because I want to feed that. I want to feed that creativity and that excitement over growing plants. Um, it's getting the young people engaged. So honestly, first and foremost, kids, I'm always, even if the plant is going to a certain doom, I'd rather get that uh, child engaged. So I'll give plants away. And then again, those who maybe don't have the means to buy it outright, I'll donate. So, but it's something you kind of have to determine for yourself, but it never hurts to grow some extras. So when you grow things from seed, you know, always grow extras because they will find homes. Yeah, hopefully that answers at least my perspective. I'm, I'm terrible at capitalism, so I can't really tell you what the right answer is. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't mean the money part. I meant more like, um, how do you determine what, like, how much do you keep versus how much do you give? Like, do you plan on 50-50 of whatever germinates? 
or uh, I I keep what I need, I guess. So I always grow so much of everything that I have, like, so right now I have a couple thousand salmon berry seedlings, Rubus spectacles, this being one of them, um, from uh, seeds I collected in Girdwood. I'm probably going to keep maybe half a dozen of them to incorporate in my food forest. I have a patch of alders where it's fairly shady. I planted some firs so, and some Sitka spruce. So I'm going to incorporate some of the salmon berries and some of the sunny openings there to take, occupy that niche and produce more abundance at the lower level. But after that, I don't need any more. So it's kind of, once I have, I, I have my need met, I'm going to share everything else. So my, my salmon berries, I don't need every salmon berry because if I planted every salmon berry I have, I would literally fill my entire acre with nothing but salmon berries and it would become a monster that nobody could ever get through. So the reality is it's just grow enough for you and then share the rest of it, if that makes any sense. Uh, Josh? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, this is Mary Helms. Hi, Mary. Um, hi, I am... Uh... I'm retired now and I'm uh, physically disabled, so I can't do the gardening that I used to do. But I have another another pet, and that's the Alaska Science and Engineering Fair. I'm a mentor to students across the state of Alaska. And we're doing a lot of research on different things. Um, I would really like to get you involved with some of the young kids because I think that this next generation is going to be the ones that are going to impact it. Um, yep. Especially our kids out in rural areas, because we now have um, um, the pandemic allowed us to do more uh, with our uh, virtual platforms. So um, how is the best way to get a hold of you to be able to um, talk to you more in depth? I, I'm notoriously bad about responding to my Facebook messenger. Um, I can message you Mary, uh, later up, Mary, and it give you my phone number. And then if you text and call me, I'm much more apt to respond to that than my messenger. So I, yeah. I, I have my, my ADHD kicks in and I'll have a response. I'm like, oh, I need to give that one more thought. And so when I see that and then I forget about it. And then a month later, I still haven't responded to that original question. So right. it's a toxic trait of mine. So, um, Remind me um, on Messenger, and then I'll send you my number. And then from there, if you reach out to me, either calling or texting, I'm going to respond back. So I love your message, and I love what you're you're talking about there, because honestly, these young people are going to change everything. So there's no, I want to give them all the tools and all the knowledge I have, and I want them to take it 20 steps further. Um, anyone else have a question for Josh? I don't have a question, Josh. My name is Shelly Martin, and I live down in the Kodiak region on a smaller island off of Kodiak. I, I would know. definitely be interested in being part of these science projects. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, Sorry, go ahead. I'll give you my information in Messenger. Yes, please. Because, uh, again, that's going to be the key here. Like, uh, these, these science projects, the more microclimates we can bring in and the more... The more people from different organizations we can bring in, the more apt we are to like kind of come together. Because we've seen too many times in the past where, okay, hey, the university has this project going, like case in point, the University of Idaho for years, they were developing, trying to domesticate the huckleberry. They were three to five years out from releasing a cultivar, funding dried up, they cut and destroyed everything. So not having all our eggs in one basket, diversifying this like community science project, so to speak, having the university, having big farms, having the um, different private businesses, having tribal organizations, having communities and schools and nonprofits, having them all involved in this project, it's going to go a lot further. So again, I'd love to talk to you about how we can get you involved in this project. So you have a neat microclimate down there. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right. I know um, we're about 10 minutes over time. Well, uh, we're happy to keep Josh here forever. Yeah. Um, Josh is there forever. anybody else with a burning question? Uh, looks like Emily, are you waiting to ask a question? Yes. Hi. Uh, I had a question that I couldn't really hear if there was an answer. Um, my question is, what is a mechanical garden? A mechanical garden? Um, I, I'm not 100% what you're referencing. Um, do you have more context? Well, I heard in the video that I think I heard that... Um, you said something about a mechanical garden. Um, 
I'm not. I'm not a botanical. Oh, botanical okay. garden. Yeah, well, yeah, that could have happened. Uh, it's probably that. Was I talking about hazelnuts? Yeah. Yes. So, um, again, Glenna and Katie up in Fairbanks, they planted some of the hybrid hazelnuts at the Georgetown Botanical Garden. Which, on a side note, I grew up in Fairbanks. The Botanical Garden was my happy place. Like, I was my pilgrimage at least a couple times a summer, and I would just go frolic in the Botanical Garden, see how everything was doing. Um, being able to actually plant things in the botanical garden as an adult is honestly the biggest honor. So, thanks everybody, um, and uh, make sure you follow Josh. I, I, bet, I bet you already are on social media. It's lots of fun. There's always great info. So, thanks so much for joining us, Josh. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. <laughs>